Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. This is a webinar, uh, the second one in a series of five uh, that's called Bioeconomy in Our Daily Life. And uh, this one is called What the Tree Can Do. It's part of the Bloom Project, uh, that's an European uh, project that aims to bring together partners from across Europe to debate, communicate and engage uh, the public and different stakeholders uh, in the potential of bioeconomy. Uh, Bloom, boosting European citizen knowledge and awareness of bioeconomy, research and innovation. So, we in this webinar, we want to uh, share uh, some perspective of what the tree can do. Uh, there will be a short, uh, uh, short uh, presentations with some experts, followed by questions and um, a panel discussion. We have some housekeeping rules. Uh, in this webinar, uh, we use the chat only for technical questions. And if you have, which I hope you have some questions for us about bio bioeconomy and uh, forest bioeconomy, especially, uh, you can write them in the Q and A. Uh, you find that one uh, in the Zoom window, the Q and A talking bubbles. Uh, so you can write uh, your question there. You could, can be anonymous if you want to. And the whole project, Bloom Project, is working to make dialogue, as I said. And um, if we have good dialogue, then there's no such thing as a stupid question. And today we are this group of people joining from the Bloom um, team. Um, the, the, the What a Tree Can Do seminar is uh, coordinated by, by the Nordic Hub in collaboration with the Dutch Hub. And here you see some of us. My name is Lotta Westerberg Thomasson, as you can see at last at this slide. And I'm a communication strategist at VA Public and Science in Sweden. But we are not in focus. Today we are talking to some experts of forest bioeconomy all over Europe. And um, I would really love to see if you have um, answered some of the menti questions before we start. My colleague, um, Maria, could you please show us if you have some results from the, uh, the menti? Yes, so what we see that we have at least 20 of our participants. Welcome to all of you. And the most of you are actually coming from Finland. And we had Netherlands second running up, but we also have participants from joining us from Scotland, Ukraine, Italy, Poland, and uh, even India. And of course, Sweden, where we are, and Germany. So welcome to all of you. Austria also. Welcome. That's nice. Um, do we have the other? Um... Yes. So from which part of society are you all from? Uh, the major part of you actually comes from the scientific community. Uh, but we also have a large part coming uh, from the business and industry, as well as some students. Welcome to you, teachers, uh, some policymakers and NGOs, and some media and communication representatives. So you're all very welcome to this uh, webinar. <laughs> Thank uh, you so much. Uh, sorry, this is Kirsi. Uh, so in chat, we see that there is also a participant from Norway and Macedonia. Great, welcome. <laughs> we have one question more in the, in the Menti that you could, could answer if you want. And it's to get a bit of a common ground. Um, that's um, what you uh, think of um, when you think about the word forest bioeconomy, bio do we have some answers there? Uh, 
The main, the main answers at the moment is uh, our sustainability, sustainable paper, energy, wood, um, oh. biodiversity, replace fossil materials. Welcome to you all. And now we should present our first, see our first expert here. Um, this is uh, Katarina Torvinen, research manager from VTT Technical Research Center of Finland. I so glad that you can join us today and you're going to talk about cellulose fibers. And um, yeah, I leave the, the word to you. Please, welcome. Thank you, Lotta. Okay, hopefully you see now my screen as well. Yes, it works. Uh, thanks, Lotta, for your kind introduction. And also welcome to this webinar on my behalf. Uh, so I will talk today shortly to you about cellulose fibers and also the... Um, ongoing, ongoing uh, project uh, pro product developments and opportunities related to cellulose fibers. Okay, so um, I will start uh, to saying that at VTT we do not do the science and research for, the, for their own sake. So at, at this moment in this challenging world, we are tackling the greatest challenges in the world. So uh, this we do together with our customers and our other stakeholders and collaborators. And together we are creating sustainable growth and competitive advantage in, in this process. And uh, thinking about uh, the, some, some uh, challenges of today, there is of course a growing significant uh, this kind of awareness of, of uh, this kind of environmental effects of the plastics. And this is powering uh, ban bans and also these kind of uh, statements uh, due to the plastic use. Um, there is of course critical to develop circulation systems. So that means all the, all the, all the value chain about the sorting, about uh, the collecting, and recycling and reusing of plastics. But at the same time, there is a lot of potential to develop uh, alternative materials for plastics. Uh, there we have to keep in our mind that uh, we don't want environmental hurdles to be created. So for example, the case of the microplastics we have to consider all the time when we are developing new materials that they don't cause that kind of problems. So, and, and we really think that uh, wood cellulose, or it can be also other biomass cellulose, but uh, special, especially in Finland, we are uh, really, really keen about the wood cellulose material. We believe that that is really opportunity to be this kind of super material in the future. And why is that? Uh, that is because it's really ecological alternative uh, for the plastics, uh, for the chemicals, for the composites materials. It will grow and actually it will bind carbon uh, and then reduce uh, at the same time carbon emissions. And it will mitigate to the climate change. And, and what is the most important here it is that we can even uh, uh, even develop properties beyond uh, beyond nowadays plastics materials. So we believe that there is un unexpected superior functional uh, properties available. And uh, in overall cellulose is also the most abundant polymer in the world. And it's naturally biodegradable and it's easy, easily recyclable and repulpable. And if we want really to, to reduce our carbon emissions and, and help the climate change situation, we need to replace fossil-based materials and the wood cellulose is the most promising alternative in both in fiber and also in polymer mode. We have already uh, uh, examples of 
of nowadays world. So traditionally, if we think about cellulose, uh, it's mostly used in paper and board in packaging application and in hygiene products. But the, the variety of, of the opportunities has grown uh, really, really a lot in, in these recent years. And we have already really nice, uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, smaller and also medium-sized uh, companies growing in Finland. And, uh, and uh, be, uh, also, also these uh, applications can be, can be other than uh, packaging applications. So for example, these uh, wood-based cellulose uh, textile fibers are emerging technologies uh, in Finland in many ways. So there is uh, a lot of, lot of uh, activities on that field. There is uh, this kind of uh, dissolving technologies with solvent, solvents and also, also non-dissolved cellulose-based fibers. Like uh, one example is the Spinova, which is a spin-off company of VTT. So they are producing uh, non-dissolved textile fibers based on the mechanically produced microfibrillated cellulose and their unique spinning technology. There is also possibilities for the uh, construction materials and, and medical applications as well, available already. Then when we think about really the mitigation of due to climate change and, and meeting the targets for climate, we have made estimation calculation at VTT, so how we can actually achieve that. So uh, if we do collaboration with, with different kind of stakeholders and boundaries and, and really uh, uh, build together ecosystems and a new these kind of high value products, it's possible even in Finland to, to uh, increase the total export of the forest-based materials and value of them. And at the same time, it, it will grow the GDP in Finland. Uh, there we have to concentrate to, to develop materials which have the higher value. And the examples are like, uh, like textiles, like biocomposites, like uh, building and construction materials, as well as well uh, cellulose-based electronics. That is really, really also emerging possibilities there. I, I will show you now some examples of what, what we have already done. So first example is about the packaging materials. This is a really uh, winning concept. So this is like monomaterial, a multi-layer structure uh, application to, the, to the, this kind of, uh, for example, dry fo food uh, materials, packaging. Uh, we have used there uh, two different kind of cellulosic material. The, the one is thermoplastic cellulose. So it's, it's this kind of modified cellulose uh, esterification of the cellulose. And there we can, we can actually achieve the needed barrier properties. Uh, we have used also nanocellulose film between the thermoplastic cellulose layers and the nanocellulose film is actually also our new material, uh, which is this kind of high consistency enzyma enzymatically uh, produced nanocellulose. So this has actually won many, many already challenges and awards. Then uh, we have technology, which is foam forming in, in really keep it simple. Uh, the foam forming me means that we add uh, air bubbles also uh, to the water, with water in, in when we make the, the paper or board. Or it can be even, even more than that. So we have actually demonstrated uh, many new kind of applications as well with this foam forming. So the idea of, of the using air bubbles is that then we prevent the flocculation of the fibers and, and we can actually at the same time achieve energy and material savings. And this actually uh, brings us to the, this kind of really new applications, making thick or porous, porous materials as well as this kind of non-wovens uh, 
materials, which are not possible with, with the traditional water forming. And the third and my last example of this, this kind of new, new uh, cellulose fiber materials is, is nanocellulose applications. Nanocellulose is, is really uh, this kind of enable in, in many different kind of applications. We have already that in many packaging applications and also in cosmetics and, and this kind of uh, emulsions. But uh, the, it can be more and more. So, of course, uh, these uh, some of these are really in, in the lower technology readiness level yet, but we see a lot of opportunities also in, in these electronic devices and optical structures, as well as, as for example, capturing microplastics, capturing hormones from the water, so using it in, in the, to have more cleaner uh, water and air as well as in, in textiles and diagnostics membranes. There is a lot of possibilities. Uh, so I will end my presentation here and, and just uh, wanting you to know that it's not just that we use cellulose fibers to replace fossil-based materials, but we are really creating some superior materials with an unexpected properties. And, and those we believe that we can we can actually be really competitive in many, many different kind of material applications in future. So thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, I'm happy to, to try to provide so, uh, answers for those. Thank you. Thank you, Katharina. Really interesting. Uh, so if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. And uh, I have one question, uh, because you showed a lot of um, interesting examples, but what kind of products do you see has the best commercial potential of, of these cellulose-based products? Yeah, in, in, if you think about uh, this year and this moment, I think the packaging applications are the, the most uh, relevant and the most biggest one at this moment, um, but what are really in, in high volume as well, they are these textile fibers. So I, I would say that those ones are in, in, in the high volumes are the, the most relevant ones now. We're gonna talk, we have some questions about uh, the sustainable, uh, the sustainability of, of the wood and, and tree to, to use all this um, uh, new materials. We're gonna talk about that uh, a bit later in the panel discussion and so on. So uh, I think uh, we do um, do it like this, that we, we um, listen to our next speaker and we yes. can talk a bit later. So, we have a lot of questions in the Q&A now, and we try to answer them as quick as we can. And now, uh, and say welcome to our next expert, Richard Goslink from Wageningen Food and Biobased Research. You're going to talk about lignin, lignin products, products, um, and uh, please welcome. Let's hear what you have to say. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome also from Holland. Well, welcome again. I'm uh, Richard Gosling, and today I'm going to talk about lignin products from research to demonstration. And um, two applications will be mentioned there: bio asphalt and also thermoset resins. And at the end, I will talk a little bit about our uh, lignin network, which we are running uh, nowadays in Europe. I'm actually working at Wageningen Food and Biobased Research, which is an applied research organization to work together in multidisciplinary teams uh, to find solutions for, uh, for uh, companies in the bioeconomy. Uh, we have possibilities to, uh, to do research on lab scale, but also going to uh, pilot scale. And we have a strong connection with the university departments of Wageningen, which gives us a very good uh, research environment. Half of my colleagues are uh, working at uh, food related um, research and the other half are working on bio-based products like lignin. What is lignin and why is it interesting? Well, lignin is a main component of lignin cellulosic biomass like wood but also straw and, and, and grasses or herbaceous biomass also uh, belong into that group. 
it is a large side stream of the pulp and paper industry and also in the upcoming biorefinery industry for the production of uh, bioethanol but also biochemicals. Uh, there's a huge availability of lignin although nowadays not all the lignin is used uh, as a product but mainly used as energy source to feed the processing for, for energy. Uh, lignin has uh, very interesting properties uh, like a natural binder in, uh, in, in the woody tree to give it more resistance to, uh, to the environment. It is also more water resistant than other components like cellulose. It has an aromatic ring structure which you can see on the slide. It gives also um, UV stab stabilization uh, in a tree but it can also be one of the components or the functionalities for which you can use lignin in a product. And lignin resembles uh, quite some products which are originated from fossil resources, which I will highlight in one of the applications. And valorization of lignin is, is really in, interesting for biorefineries to make it more economically feasible. Because if you use lignin for energy, it has a certain value. But if you put it into a, a product like a material or a chemical, your value will increase substantially. At Wageningen Food and Bias Research, we do a lot of research uh, on, among others, uh, lignin as one of the uh, natural biopolymers. And we look at the different type of lignin because lignin is not just one biopolymer, but a whole class of different uh, structures depending on uh, bot botanical origin and, and the processing. Uh, we can do conversion, we can functionalize the lignin uh, to meet the requirements for different applications. And you can see in the slides several interesting applications which are under development and some of those are already at a uh, high TRL level. For instance, uh, polyurethane foams, uh, resins, uh, an additive for, for polymers, rubbers and also asphalt. If we look at the potential for, for lignin production versus uh, the use of lignin in, in all kinds of markets, all kinds of products, then you can see in this slide, in the blue boxes, we have several types of lignins, as you can see here. Here you have the, uh, the craft lignin, which is basically the lignin which is abundantly available and also the one which is available as really as a product. And here we have a lot of different, uh, in the green box, a lot of different applications with different values and different uh, market volumes. And you can see here that bitumen, for instance, is a uh, bulky application at relatively low value, around uh, 400, 500 euros per ton, while for phenolic resins, you can see here, it is a, a reasonable market around 1 million tons per year, but at a much higher price around 1,000 euros per ton. Then I will highlight two applications. Uh, one is uh, asphalt, where we would like to use lignin as a bitumen, sub bitumen substitute. And the reason for that is that uh, we expect scarcity of bitumen in the near future, because a lot of oil refineries are not producing bitumen anymore. Uh, they change their processing to get more lights, more fuels. And of course, we would like to maintain our binder quality. So we are looking for a real substitute for this fossil resource. One of the advantages of using lignin is that it's also a possibility to store for a long time in the road and also include in recycling for really a long, a long period that we can store biogenic carbon. So we take the carbon out of the, out of the year and store it in the material. Also with lignin, we have the possibility to add extra functionality into asphalt, that it is not only using to substitute bitumen, but that we also get extra functionality, like um, maybe a longer durability or longer lifetime. And a longer lifetime really means less maintenance. And in the maintenance of a road, there are a lot of costs are associated with. So there's the real business case. Uh, we talk about a large market, a huge market uh, in the Europe is around uh, 50 million tons uh, bitumen used every year. So what we did in, um, in this uh, application, we uh, show that it is possible to use lignin and bitumen in a mix, in a blend, and that we can reduce the bitumen content with 50%. So that's really a lot in, in, this, in this application. First, we started with, uh, with a lab scale test, as you can see in the, in the slide small blocks uh, which were tested uh, in accelerated um, durability test and, and weathering test. Then 
after approval of the requirements, we got to the demonstration phase where you can see that we've made uh, small lanes of bio asphalt of about 10 square meters, which is already quite a lot if you consider uh, that in your, in your backyard. And finally, we were able to, uh, to produce a lot of demonstration roads in the Netherlands, about 12 in total at the moment. And the first one was uh, already paved in 2015. So nowadays we have five years experience uh, in real outdoor application and testing of this uh, demonstration road. Uh, the demonstration road in 2015 is on an industrial road, which is loaded with a lot of uh, heavy trucks and cars. The other one highlighted in the left is at the Wageningen campus where we have the first cycling path uh, paved in 2017 with different types of lignin in different sections. And that uh, cycling path is uh, behaving very well uh, during the last three years. If you look at um, what kind of uh, lignins we have tested, uh, we, we screen a lot of different ones from the pulp and paper industry, but also from the biorefinery industry. And depending on the test and the requirements we got, um, we can select the, the most suitable ones, for example, soda, craft and hydrolysis, uh, straw lignin, which are really used in this uh, application at the Wageningen campus. And uh, you can see in the slide that uh, the dry strength is, is always higher than the wet strength. But to be able to put it uh, in this application, you should at least retain the dry strength for 80% uh, during uh, underwater testing, and that's uh, really uh, really severe uh, testing. And uh, most of the lignins uh, are able to meet those requirements, but you can also see that, for example, uh, hydrolysis poplar did not meet the, uh, these requirements. I briefly talk about additional functionality, and there we can also see in these results that uh, we can also meet these requirements, like uh, fatigue resistance, uh, track formation, and also durability, which are, of course, important parameters to, uh, to use lignin in this application. Then the second application is on uh, thermosetting resins. And thermosetting resins are already uh, used for a long period, especially in panel and boards where you would like to use the panels in under humid conditions or outdoor conditions. We're talking about a market of roughly 1 million tons per year based on phenol formaldehyde resins. And the reason to use lignin is to uh, substitute fossil phenol to reduce formaldehyde, which is a toxic uh, crosslinker. And lignin has a structure which resembles the, the structure of phenol formaldehyde. Uh, we typically see that soft tooth uh, lignin has a favorable crosslinking ability, which means that it can be used to synthesize a uh, lignin based resin. We see already that in 2006, there was uh, some commercial activity on this, substituting 30% of the phenol in a typical lignin phenol formaldehyde resin. And in 2019, we saw that several companies are able to produce 50% uh, replacement of uh, phenol by lignin in different applications. I will come back to that in a, in a minute. The challenge still is the reactivity of the lignin, because lignin has a biopolymer um, has lower reactivity than phenol, for instance. For this uh, application, we work together with Trespa in the Netherlands. Uh, Trespa is a well-known company uh, producing high-pressure laminates, very strong uh, panels for outdoor use and, and tables uh, or lab, uh, lab tables, um, for instance. Uh, we started with selection of the different lignin sources and also look at the synthesis because it's really important to uh, to develop a novel synthesis where you use lignin, phenol, and formaldehyde together to produce high quality resin material. Uh, after uh, full testing uh, over, the, over the years, uh, Tressor was able to run pilot scale runs uh, a few years ago. And finally in 2019, a comm commercialization of this uh, application was done by ARPA, one of the subsidiaries of, uh, of Tressor in uh, Italy. They call it uh, HPL Phoenix Bloom product. You can find more information on the, on the internet as well, which really shows a lower environmental footprint by using lignin and 50% of phenol has been replaced by lignin. And it also results in a lower addition of formaldehyde in the synthesis. So these are very good examples uh, of using lignin 
as a side product of biorefinery. And um, yeah, those, those applications are ready at commercial CRL level or a demonstration level. Uh, we see also that the industry is more eager to invest in lignin extraction, because if you would like to fulfill all the uh, substitution of bio-bitumen or uh, phenol, we need a lot of lignin. And lignin valorization is really essential to make biorefineries more economic feasible. Uh, of course, we still have challenges, like uh, we need a lot of lignin, so you have to develop new value chains and also meet the demand and supply. Further on, if we are going to uh, think about the next level, uh, substituting uh, a higher rate of phenol or a higher rate of bitumen, we also need uh, more reactivity of the lignin. So the lignin should be more suitable for those higher uh, substitution rates. And of course, we need a lot of uh, demonstration roads or demonstration products to really see how it behaves in practice how it behaves in the user phase. Well, to, to meet all the uh, uh, challenges, we started a uh, Ligno cost network, which is actually a cost action. And you can find more information in this uh, slide on, the, on our website. And if uh, persons are interested in knowing more about Ligno valorization, please contact us. Uh, maybe it would be nice to, uh, to attend this uh, network. Perfect. Thank Last you, Rickard. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, two different uh, questions here. Um, uh, in lignin is used uh, for for the energy at the moment in in the factories that produce pulp. So how how well could these other applications of lignin compete with this? You think? Yes, the, the base case is still using lignin for energy application in the in the current mills. But we know that uh, in a mill, it can be uh, designed that 20% of the lignin can be extracted without disturbing the energy balances in the current mills. For new mills, and you see that it is really happening, that they are more thinking about co-production of cellulose, sugars, and lignin. So there you have a different design, making use of um, other uh, energy balances and also the, the possibility to co-produce different products. Thank you. Uh, we are coping with your questions in, in the Q&A and, and try to answer as many as we can. But now we uh, need to move forward to our next expert. So, uh, welcome, Josefine Illegård. You're a researcher and platform coordinator uh, at TreeSearch. And you're going to talk a bit about, uh, overall, about new materials from the forest and, and um, what we can look forward to in the future. There's so much research going on, isn't it? Yeah, so I will only be able to talk about some, a few examples of what we can see in the future. There is so much to, sh to, um, to choose from. Uh, so, as Lotte said, my name is Josef Van uh, and I'm a researcher at KKH Royal Institute of Technology in, uh, in Stockholm. I'm mostly working with the collaboration platform TreeSearch. Uh, so, this is actually my forest. Uh, and even though we're not planning to cut down the trees now, I'm going to show you that maybe in the future when we cut down the trees, what can we do from that? So. TreeSearch is a collaboration platform. It's a kind of network for Swedish, research, <laughs> Swedish researchers uh, that supports and gathers uh, the research. And, and I will, but the result, present, uh, the result I will present will be mostly from uh, the, a research center called Wallenberg Wood Science Center. And uh, not all of the results will be from that, but uh, even though the researchers are mostly connected to that. So, this is kind of the starting point for our research, the tree, of course. So what we're trying to do now in research is that we're trying to understand the tree down to nanoscale level. Uh, we still don't know everything about the tree, although we have been performing research for quite some long time. So now we're down at a nanoscale level and see what components we can use to make new materials. So we can say that we go from microscale to nanoscale, and then we want to go to nanoscale to our microscale to our materials. So you can do, of course, find a lot of components in there. We have heard some of them just uh, before, but lignin. Uh, so I will talk some about uh, nanocellulose is 
that kind of is like smallest fibers or fibrils, smaller than fibers, that you can find in wood. That can, that is uh, that the wood cell wall is made of when you look at. So it's basically if you have a pulp fiber and divide it into the smallest parts, then you get nanocellulose. And when you go down to nanocell nanoscale, and it's nanoscale in width, the length can differ a little bit. You get very interesting properties. Uh, so here you, uh, for instance, if you would have the nan nanocellulose on your bench uh, in a sample, you, it would look like this. It would look like a gel, because it it takes up a lot of water. So what can you make out of it? Uh, well, I'll. Though the first examples of this, what you could make of nanocellulose was to use in food stuff, such as ice cream, you can do much more. Of course, we can make a paper out of it. We can make a, even the world's strongest paper. Uh, although it's, it is strong for being a paper, if you would look at the individual fibrils, they are much stronger. So how, if we want to make a strong material, how could we use this nanocellulose fibrils to make a strong material. Well, if you look at this uh, electron microscopy uh, image down to the right, you see that they are randomly distribute, distributed. What if we could align them similar to what is this spaghetti uh, to have them all in the same direction? Well, that's some of the, what some researchers in VBS have done. And it's not as easy as just taking the spaghetti, of course, is that we have to have different techniques for that. And what they have used is water or microfluidics, having the water flow, uh, having a very controlled flow. So this is what you see an illustration of. So it's actually just the nano, uh, fib, nano cellulose and water, uh, basically, that makes a, a material. And what, you, what do you get with that? You get the words strongest biomaterial that's shown here, this knot. Previously, uh, spider silk was considered the world's strongest biomaterial and although it's, it is strong, this material is eight times stronger than spider silk. So perhaps Spider-Man should reconsider using nanocellulose instead. But strength is not the only good thing about nanocellulose. You can do more. So if you would look at this gel, you could, for instance, remove the water and get a network, a 3D network. Uh, um, then you can get aerogels and foams. It's very lightweight material. And if you would look at it with a microscope, you would see that it contains a lot of air, which explains then, of course, uh, why it is lightweight. So it's easy to picture here on the right. It's actually on a leaf. With this material itself, uh, you get very interesting properties. You can get insulation properties, for instance. But one of the things I think is so interesting about cellulose and non-cellulose is that you could uh, functionalize it and get new properties. So, some, so you can consider this uh, gels and foams as kind of a material platform to have to get uh, more types of material, more functionality. So some of the things that research, researchers have been doing is having them absorb oil. So the red you see here is uh, oil, and afterwards it's totally containing all the oil, or more or less. So you will, this could be used in an oil uh, explosion, for instance. Uh, one other thing is that this is, has a really huge surface area when it comes down to this. Uh, and researchers have been doing, developing this uh, into soft batteries. So as you see here on this picture is one kind type of uh, battery. So then perhaps you could have uh, both an insulation material and energy storage in one. And the thing is shown here where uh, the nanocellulose air gel is used for desalinate water, making pure drinking water by just using the sunlight. So you can see that the water is going up there. So, so a lot of you can use you can use this for a lot of different things, and then I haven't even started to talk about antibacterial or fire resistant and you other electronic properties. Uh, not to talk about what you can make with all the other components, cellulose fibers, lignin, and hemicellulose, and extracted. 
but the time is limited now, so I can't talk <laughs> more about it. Uh, but I would say some things about how, why we are able to do this and how we should go on in the future. All the things that I've shown haven't, haven't been possible if we hadn't cooperated. This is uh, where people from with different scientific backgrounds, such as chemistry, biology, biotechnology, physics, computers, well, we get together and we're able to form this. So it really goes down to competence. And working together is also something really important, which is to make these new materials for the future. Uh, and then also about cooperating uh, with universities and uh, with the industry. And that is what research is trying to facilitate or help with. So this is a, a Swedish collaboration platform uh, where we try also to collaborate on research and also this competence for the new materials from the future from the forest and to, to make enable a future bioeconomy. Oh, that's so interesting. Uh, I'm really excited uh, to see what the future holds. But we, we have some uh, one question here that um, about this nanocellulose because uh, some people uh, in the public and the society are a bit scared of this nano size. Mm -hmm. Is there any any risk analysis or things like that when when you do new products with this nano format? Of course, we need to make sure that everything is safe when we do this. First, as I said, what we are doing is developing a pl platform uh, for, for the future material. When you go to product, you, of course, much, must take, make sure uh, that we don't do the mistakes we previously made, have something harmful. Cellulose in itself is not harmful for humans. Uh, it's biocompatible. And there are also some... Uh, projects uh, that are looking at it. When we modify it in a way, we also introduce new properties, so then we need to evaluate all those things. Nice! Um, time is running and I think we have a lot of questions in the Q&A, but we're answering them as uh, quick as we can, as said. Um, we have one last expert to talk to and the, some of your questions is uh, about this subject. We have our last but not least expert joining us today. Uh, welcome Diana. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Diana Tomasjuka, you're a principal scientist and team lead uh, in sustainable bioeconomy at EFI, European Forest Industry. So, uh, 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 institute, institute. Institute, sorry, it's the, not industry, sorry. <laughs> institute. Uh, yes, so please. All right, thank you. I want to thank my uh, previous speakers because you gave some wonderful examples of what you can do with wood. What I'm going to do is I will talk a bit more about wood and forests and how they can contribute sustainably to the circular bioeconomy. As a bit of background, I'm from EFI, the European Forest Institute, and we are an international institute and focusing on connecting science-based knowledge to action. Our vision is for a world is where forests are significantly contributing to sustainable well-being. And we do that by uh, providing the best available research and uh, linking it to the policymakers, to the general public. We have uh, three fields of research. One is by economy, one is on resilience, and one is on governance. And uh, with that, I want to talk about the forest space by economy a bit uh, more generally. Uh, forests are a um, very important part of the European landscape with a big diversity from the types of landscapes, forest, forest management, forest traditions throughout Europe. If you're interested in, in different types of tree species or availability, this map gives a bit of an overview of where are the forests and what are the different tree species. And as we heard before about different uh, trees and different properties and different products, so you can imagine that each type of tree species has got a different potential to be produced for something for the bioeconomy. Currently, if you look at the forest-based bioeconomy, we have forestry, of course. We have uh, wood products and furniture and paper. But then, of course, also the potential of um, forest to be used in other 
included as we have assessed. Looking at the current um, profile of the excuse me, forest based bioeconomy, forests amount up to 38% of the total land area, and that means 177 million hectares in Europe. The annual felling rate currently is 66% of the net annual increment, meaning some 458 million cubic meters. Now, these are numbers that may not tell you much, but just to let you know, um, as forests growth, if you would um, harvest what is uh, growing each year, so the increment, 100% of the increment, in theory, with a bit of other factors to which I come a better back later, you would have about the same amount of timber and forest standing. So this basically shows we are using about two thirds of the annual increment. So there is a potential to increase. Now uh, this figure, uh, 7, 722 million cubic meters that could be potentially uh, harvested uh, sustainably, is not the total increment, uh, but it is based on studies by Fakerk et al. Uh, calculated with a uh, um, model called FSN. So it uh, excludes all the protected areas, it doesn't touch that at all. It excludes all the fragile sites and all those areas that are not uh, accessible by machinery. So when it comes to the availability of uh, how much timber would be theoretically available, it would be a lot more like how and why it is not uh, harvested. That has got different reasons, um, partially related to, um, to willingness to cut, to accessibility, to wood price and similar issues, but uh, it shows we would have a potential to even increase uh, sustainable product. As of now, currently, um, the contribution of the forest-based uh, industry to the bioeconomy is about 7.3% uh, of the manufacturing total and uh, currently employing 3.3 million persons. I would like to spend some time on this admittedly a bit more complicated uh, slide, but I think it is uh, fundamental for understanding like, what is the circular bioeconomy, how is it different from the linear fossil based one and what are the different um, driving factors or demand that need to be taken into account for a circular bioeconomy to be, to be uh, successful and I want to use the example of forests as one of the ecosystems. If what we had so far is mainly a linear uh, economy and a fossil based one. So you uh, harvest the material, no matter if it's now on a virtual materials or if it's fossil or something, use it and throw it away. And this of uh, system has brought us in a situation that it's not sustainable at all. But we need to change our way of thinking, our way of, um, of doing business and also our way of researching. And that's where the circular bioeconomy comes in. One thing is, uh, yes, the use of biomass, but we're not talking about a one-to-one -one replacement of fossil with bio-based material. We, yes, we look at virtual materials, but we also look at uh, cascading use of those. So we talk about production of, of the biomass, using in old and new application, if it's now chemicals or materials, biofuels, into um, different products and we heard some examples of what can be done, so pretty much everything. But then part of the new challenge is to design products that have got circularity in uh, already as part of the design, so that at the end of the lifetime it can be either reused or reused in a different uh, setup or cascaded and of final words. So this is only part of the circular loop, but that is not all that is part of the circular bioeconomy. Far more important is a more holistic view of the ecosystem. So not uh, of just of the different sectors, of the different functions, but of uh, wood and forests as one um, big. So with that, I want to talk more about ecosystem services. Some of you may be uh, already familiar with the term, but for those who are not, let me try to open it up a bit. Forests are, um, uh, are an ecosystem that are interacting with uh, a lot of the landscapes, but also a lot of different functions uh, in different systems. And in general, you can classify ecosystem services into three different categories. One is the provisioning services, of which part is the biomass, but also things like noise control, filtration services, uh, sequestration, um, genetic materials. Then we have the regulating uh, services, things like climate regulations, flood control, water supply, disease regulation, 
And last but absolutely not least, uh, the cultural services. If it's now recreational, aesthetic, spiritual, educational, but anything that is of a high importance uh, also for the society, for the well-being of the society. So if you talk about a uh, sustainable circular bioeconomy, don't only look at the materials, but also on how the ecosystem, the forests are managed, not only for, for forest, for wood production, but also for the benefit of the society. This includes also uh, things like services um, as part of income based on ecosystem, ecosystem services as part of the whole approach to circular bioeconomy. If you want to read a bit more on what ecosystem services are, I recommend to look at the sizes index. So there you have the different functions a bit more explained. Why are ecosystem services so important, particularly under the bioeconomy? It may sound a bit fluff like biodiversity or carbon storage, wood for social needs. Even if it's a bit difficult to put values or, or numbers on it, the importance of the biodiversity of the ecosystem service, of the different regulation functions is immense. And we will not have a bioeconomy without biodiversity. Something that we have seen uh, very much also in recent times is uh, how important actually uh, biodiversity and recreation is. And I want to show with you for that some figures from the recent uh, COVID lockdown. These are the visiting uh, hours from a forest in Cotton Forest, New Bonn. Before the um, COVID lockdown, so you can see you have less than 50 people going regularly in the mornings and in the evenings into that forest recreation a bit more during the weekends. During the lockdown, you can see that uh, the demand for people going into the forest for recreation, to, for getting out, for health, for, uh, for other issues has increased quite immensely. So the usual people were still out, but you can see that uh, the importance of going out has increased quite a lot and particularly of, of nature, natural um, surroundings like forests. So forests and forests uh, have the greatest potential to mitigate climate change while advancing the bioeconomy and enhancing biodiversity. I would like to use the next few slides to expand a bit like how do biodiversity and forest management link together? In very, very general terms, how does uh, forest growth and forest management and forestry work? Trees are influenced uh, in their growth by several factors. The one is the availability of light. The second is the availability of water, the availability of nutrients and the trees, the tree species in the stand. So regardless if it's a natural growing forest, forest without any intervention or an actively managed intense forest, this sort of system is always the same. So you have a certain amount of uh, cubic meters that can grow on a certain area. And um, how much can grow is limited by, as I said, by the light, the water, the nutrients, and the type of tree species. There is a maximum level that can grow for each forest and it varies across Europe and across different stands and sites. What forestry now does is it is uh, speeding up this growth process. So in a normal forest, you have the youth phase, the forest is growing, you have the, the mature phase accumulating, where the growth is accumulating, and then you have the old age phase. But with that also, like any natural system, trees also die. So what forestry does, it is concentrating the growth uh, in that forest on a limited number of trees to make them grow faster so that you can take that uh, carbon that's stored in the wood product out of the forest and keep it longer in uh, other products like uh, construction while in the forest the cycle of growth and carbon capture is continuing. Now how can we include more uh, biodiverse in forest management? One function is to create more diversity and you can create more diversity at the stand level and at the landscape level. One thing is, of course, tree species. It doesn't mean you have, need to have all available tree species at one stand, but uh, a good mixture between uh, the stand level diversity and the landscape uh, level. Different ages also advance uh, diversity because it, they support different uh, species, different functions, and uh, also here a mixture at stand level, but of course also landscape level. Then we have different uh, management regimes from close to nature to highly intensified managements, different functions. We have protection functions, uh, recreation functions, uh, production functions for different user groups. This is uh, important. So we have forests not only used uh, by 
timber production, but we have mentioned already the, the recreation brings in, of course, also the tourism or uh, also, let's say, um, agroforestry concepts and similar ones. And last but not least, different zones. Within one, for, uh, one forest or landscape levels, there may be zones that are not accessible or should not be accessible. So uh, managing forests at stand, but also at landscape level for diversity, promotes biodiversity, it promotes sustainability, but also resilience and the bioeconomy. Because our forests are facing a um, big threat, uh, including also with climate change, but we have more, let's say, hazardous events, more storms, more droughts, more pine beetle attacks, more forest fires. So we need to manage them, but the more diverse the structures are throughout the landscape and at the scant level, the easier it is to adjust to arrive to climate smart forestry. I've talked a lot about um, forestry as such, but I also want to give some good examples of harvesting practices. Wood harvesting is very simplified down in two different ways, either more to manual with the motor zone or by the use of harvesters. I want to highlight the use of harvesters here because they sometimes have a bit unfairly, uh, well, a rather skeptic perception because you see those big machines in the forest. However, um, they are actually developed at the highest level to uh, access forests. You can see, for example, um, carriages with their wheels and buggy bands, everything made to um, elevate the pressure on the soil because uh, what we want to reduce as much as possible is soil pressure that might uh, destroy the, the soil uh, structure and with that hamper for one thing growth, but also have, um, increase erosion. From a worker's perspective, uh, machines are very safe. You can imagine that uh, forestry work, if you do it by a uh, motor saw, is very dangerous. There's a lot of big volumes, heavy weights overhead that might fall quite unexpectedly. Often trees under tension, especially if you talk about hazardous events like wind throws, you have one tree over the other. So worker safety is uh, very important and the machines are developed that they uh, the pressure on the soils as big as possible. Also with the cranes, they have a wide reach of about 10 meters to both sides. So you don't need to touch the whole area. The use of skid roads. So basically it means uh, harvest is always driving on the same road. So driving on the same road, uh, not accessing the areas to the sides. And while harvesting, putting um, the, the slash, which means the, the tops and the branches in front of the machine to create a carpet that also helps to elevate the pressure. And uh, different uh, developments on a more digital side is uh, how to um, avoid uh, crossing over wet areas. Wet soils are very fragile soils, so that is something we want to avoid as much as possible. For instance, tech for effect has developed uh, a map for depth to water maps that you can have as part of your computer system to show um, where are the waterways, so where not to cross or where are the lowest to cross better. So there are a lot of good harvesting um, practices on the digital side, but also on the machine side that help in the harvesting side for uh, the safety of the people who do the work, but also to uh, do the harvesting as gentle as possible. With this, I would like to uh, conclude. Considerations to diversity and biodiversity at stand lathe and at landscape level are important. Uh, the whole ecosystem um, approach is important to include in a forest based by economy. The recommendation is to use the best available technology, both in machines but also in digital support in operations, particularly for considerations to soils. And taking all these aspects into mind, there is a potential to increase the harvesting levels. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Diana. Thank you so much. We're uh, having a lot of nice questions here. I would like to ask you how you think um, we should ensure that uh, this new forest-based materials are, are pr produced sustainably sustainably uh, while, while not ha hampering uh, the development of them, so to say. Sustainability, if I may go back, has yeah. overgone yeah. Um, change of definition over the 
decades. And it started from a very uh, resource-based uh, approach, like not taking more out than is growing after. That was like Kotta and Karlowitz with the industrial waste. And then we came to Brundtland where you added in more aspects like environmental aspects, then came the social aspects and economic aspects and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, all these um, definitions have uh, made it into uh, the practices in standardization like FSC or PFC, but also into the laws and regulations that we have in the different European countries. Yes. So um, while there are different regulations um, in Europe and of course in many other uh, countries worldwide, what is uh, reflected in the, um, in the legislation at country level is the absolute minimum of how to ensure that it is sustainable, but of course then forest owners have the option to do a lot more to enhance biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So that is one way. The other way, uh, when it comes to um, illegal locking, if I may take this excursion, yeah. um, also there we have legislation in Europe in place that um, the EU timber regulation that might be, so only legally timber harvested timber may make it to the European market. And what legal is, is defined in each country that has got a VPA agreement and that is also close to the sustainability definition but of course varies from country to country. So most regulations are in place to ensure an absolute minimum but then there is also the way of using certification and on top of that also what each forest owner can do and wants to do. Yes, thank you. Now I would like we're running out of time, but I would like that every one of you, our experts, could turn on your camera and have some uh, panel uh, talk with you all. Um, the last thing I would like you to comment on is, of course, this big question. Uh, what do you think the role of the forest uh, have in, in, in um, a sustain sustainable society and, and, um, and, and how important is it for, for, for going into to a circular economy in the future? Should we um, Ask Richard first, what do you think? Well, I, th I think um, uh, forestry is, is, of course, supplying the, the most biomass uh, all around the world. And today we heard that from the, from the tree, a lot of different materials can be made. And I think those materials are really important to sequester carbon dioxide into a material for a longer period. And I think the forestry and, and also uh, forestry products are really important in, in a bioeconomy uh, based on the supply from, uh, from the forestry. And um, Katarina, what do you think? So um, I, I think that we have to keep in mind uh, that uh, forest-based uh, biomass is, is really renewable and it's it's really important because we really need this kind of renewable carbon we need biocarbon uh, that we, we cannot use renewable uh, fossil based carbon as as we have done and um, you see the forestry uh, forest based products in that that loop it's it's essential that we can tackle tackle these challenges so, so I, I would say that, and of course, the circularity is, is the key there as well. So we, we have to design, eco-design the products so that those can be recyclable or if the end use applications are demanding, then biodegradable or compostable. So that, I think that is really essential. Yes, uh, Josephine, do you have something to add? I think we need to use the forest. Uh, we look at what we have. We can't continue to use the oil. Uh, it's definitely not sustainable. Uh, when you have a tree that actually takes up the carbon dioxide from the air while it's growing, and it can be grown where we don't compete with food production, and so so, the forest definitely has potential to help us go to a bioeconomy. Yes, uh, and cut. 
uh, and uh, Diana, what, what do you think is the most important uh, uh, thing for, for, for different uh, companies and organizations and, and to collaborate uh, to this future of, of um, a sustainable society in, in forestry? I think it's uh, about three different things. The one, as I, I talked no long about, uh, the integration of forest management in ecosystem services, mm -hmm. like the management of the resource is uh, important for, mm -hmm. for different user groups. The production of materials, as Katrina said, uh, something that is bio-based, but also uh, reusable, cascadable and biodegradable. And last but not least, I think it's more towards society. We need to have a change in society where we go to consuming less, longer lasting products, less uh, demands for commercial. And I think in that case, forests can contribute in that very well. Thank you so much. Um, time is running and um, I could talk about this a long, long time and we have a lot of questions in the chat. Uh, please uh, continue the discussions and we are going to answer the questions. Uh, we put them in our dialogue zone on the Bloom website where we can keep on uh, discussing and asking questions. Um, and. Uh, after this seminar, thank you all participators and attendees. We're going to send out a short survey afterwards to see what you think about it. And uh, yes, this was one of several uh, webinars about bioeconomy in our daily lives. So please be updated at the Bloom website about coming ones. We're going to talk about textiles and we're going to talk about uh, bioplastics in coming ones. So, thank you once again. Uh, it was really nice to see you all. <laughs>